Are you ready to get into the Word of God today? I am. I was telling my wife, I said, I don't know if I've ever been more excited to, to minister than I am today. And I mean that. I truly do. I was watching that clock going, come on, let's go. Because I believe God's got something he, ha- he wants to share this morning. Um, let me introduce myself. First of all, I'm Pastor Tim. I am the creative pastor here at Redemption Church. I uh, oversee multiple areas of ministry. Um, and pastors have asked me to minister to you today. And so I, I take that as a great honor and, uh, and a privilege to do so. To stand behind this pulpit and deliver the word of God is an honor. It truly is, and I don't take it lightly. And so I believe uh, God's got something real special for you today. Amen. Before we start, let's pray. We have a phrase around here that says, pray first, then work. So we're going to pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you that your presence is in this room. And I pray, Lord God, that as I deliver this message that you have, you have set out to, have, to, to go forth, Lord, that you just touch my mouth. I pray, Lord God, none of my words fall to the ground. I just pray that it just uh, pierces the heart today, Lord. And I just pray for everybody in here. I pray for them to receive the word that you have today, Lord, and uh, let it just grow in their life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, I saw a statistic yesterday that said 50% of people believe that we are in the last days. And I believe that. I believe that. I'm thinking, well, we're the other 50%. 50% of Christians believe we're in the end days. Let me specify that. But I believe we are there. And as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus, we are seeing an uproar of evil like we haven't seen. It's coming wave after wave after wave. And, and you look and you see Satan using leaders and governments and companies, musicians. You see Hollywood, athletes, schools to push a sinful and anti-Christ agenda upon us. You know, their hill to die, their hill to die on is to make perversion acceptable and purity a poison. What God calls good, they call evil. And what God call evil, they demand that we accept as good. And we ain't going to do it. We can be easily sidetracked and distracted by what we see because it does affect us on a daily basis. It affects us. And we can, we can forget, we can't forget that what we're seeing has been prophesied. Because if we believe it's the last days, then the things that we're seeing are last day events. We're seeing the uprise of evil. We're seeing the hatred. We're seeing the jealousy. We're seeing all of this stuff because God called it and said it was going to happen. It just serves as a reminder for us to be firmly rooted in the word of God. Amen. And even as we go through this week, it talks about the fact that we need to keep uh, operating in our faith. We need to keep our hands to the plow. And we need to look up because our redemption draws nigh. Amen. We need to spread the love message to everyone we see. Because the hate message is going forth loudly, we need the love message to go louder. Amen? One of the things we also need to do is remember our purpose, what our purpose here on earth is. Everyone has a purpose. And uh, we are to walk in the anointing to build up the kingdom of God. Spread the love message of Jesus Christ to the hopeless and a dying world. Not be shaken by the evil that rises and never forget the ending of the story that we win. Say it. We win. And I think it's often, and I, and I don't think I'm alone, but I'm wondering when, when, when the ex- corruption and the evil that we're experiencing will be exposed. I've thought about this many times. That I, I want to see justice against the crimes against humanity. You know, I want to see justice for the corruption and the lies that have been told to us and told to our kids. I want to see someone step in, in a gotcha style moment and ha- see the whole thing turned around. You know, and I think for years that was what we've been praying for and we've wanted to see. And I've talked to so many different people who kind of feel hopelessness and they feel uh, discouragement because we haven't seen it happen the way we've been praying for and we've wanted to see it happen in the time frame that we're wanting to see it happen in. It can be very discouraging. But I'm reminded by a scripture that talks about in Isaiah chapter 55. And we're going to go there real quick. It's in uh, verse 8 through 9. And it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
So what does that do? That means we just need to trust in the Lord. We need to pray for God's will to be accomplished in the earth and keep moving on with what God has called us to do, regardless of what happens. None of this surprises God. The things that you turn on the news and see, regardless of which news you turn on and see, is not a surprise to God because he's aware and he has a plan. You know, Luke chapter 8 verse 17 says this, For nothing is secret and will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. So sin and all things lurking in the dark will get exposed. And as I said, Jesus wins. And because Jesus wins, we win. It says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are victorious in him. Amen. Amen. So again, we trust in the Lord and in his plan, and we live by faith and have the assurance that we are victorious. And when when news and all of this stuff frustrates us and we see abominations happening right before our eyes, we need to pray for those who do us wrong. Pray that God changes their heart. Pray for righteousness to prevail in all situations. And it's also good to ask God, do you want me to speak, and when do you want me to speak, and how do you want me to speak? Because I believe there are voices that need to be heard. And pray that God tells you if you're that voice in certain circumstances, be willing to speak up at school board meetings. Be willing to speak up wherever your voice is able to be heard. Pray about that. God, how do you want to use me in these situations? I want justice, but honestly, wouldn't we rather they receive Jesus? That's the root cause of the problem, amen? You know, we don't need to sit back and wonder what God's going to do and when. We need to be active on what God has called and equipped us to do. We've been anointed by God for the purpose and the plan for these last days and these last hours that we're living in. You know, this morning I feel very strong in my spirit that the Lord is looking to increase your anointing today that is within you. I believe God wants to take you to a new level and that he will be, you will have the ability to do greater things than you have ever seen before. Today. Today. Everyone say today. John chapter 14, verse 12. In the New Living Translation says this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. Because I'm going to be with my Father. I believe each of us can operate in a greater anointing. And that anointing will change the hearts and the lives of those around us. A greater anointing can change the atmosphere in all the places that we go. And signs and wonders and miracles can take place. I believe that. I believe that. You know, there's a group that believe that miracles stopped happening after Jesus left the earth. And ascended into heaven. It was only for that specific point in time. But I'll tell you right now, I believe in the God of miracles. I believe that God is still healing. I believe God is still delivering. Amen? Hallelujah. I believe that. But I'll tell you right now, there is also a price to be paid for this anointing. You want an anointing where miracles happen, where signs and wonders happen. There is a price to pay for that anointing. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And the title of my message is, You Get What You Pay For. Say it. Say, you get what you pay for. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're living in the last days. And you can imagine with that, the spirit realm is ramping up and you can feel it. You can feel it in the spirit. And God is, uh, is in search of an on fire, hungry church that has their anointing stirred up. And they're operating in the gifts of the Spirit and seeing the power of God being manifested upon the earth. That is what God is looking for in this day and age. He's not looking for lukewarm people to fill a seat that have zero signs of fruit coming from them. That is not at all what God is looking for right now. Just as that video said, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. God is looking for some Holy Spirit-filled, anointed laborers that will go where he tells them to go, that will do what they tell them to do, and they'll say what they tell them to say regardless of convenience, circumstances, or situations. 
And as we get closer to Jesus returning, our responsibilities and our passions for souls and our anointing should be increasing. So as evil increases, so should our anointing be increased. As you see evil rising, so should our passion for souls. So shall our hunger for the things of God. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit moved into your life, bringing an anointing upon you. The anointing is what gives you the right to be a child of God. And as a child of God, you receive the full benefits and the authority of the kingdom. I'm going to take this a little further. John chapter 1 and verse 12. Can we put that up in the Amplified Classic version? It says, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, the power, the privilege, and the right to become the children of God, that is, to those who believe and adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. So when you called on the name of the Lord and you accepted Jesus, you were anointed as a child of God. And it comes with that anointing, gives you authority, gives you power, privilege, and the rights of a child of God. Anointing designates authority. When you look at the anointing, what the anointing is in the Bible, you see it used in many different ways. You saw people anointed with oil for healing. It talks about this in Mark chapter 6, verse 13. And it says, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. The anointing demonstrates power and authority over demons and sickness. Anointing oil was used to consecrate the tabernacle in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. The anointing sets apart something that is not holy and makes it holy. The anointing takes something that is just ordinary and turns it into something extraordinary. Hallelujah. Prophets, priests, kings, they were anointed. And that anointing gained them the authority they needed so they could carry out their responsibilities of leadership. David was anointed as a boy to be king of Israel. He was first anointed as a boy to be king. And then later on at the right time, he was appointed as the king. Anointing is the method of consecration to declare authority. Anointing gives you authority. Say that, anointing gives me authority. Type that in the chat this morning. Anointing gives me authority. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, and what here it is, you have Jesus, he's fulfilling the prophecy from the prophet Joel, and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are pressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus was anointed by God the Father with the power of the Holy Spirit for his authority and his responsibility was to preach, to heal, proclaim with authority and power. And that's exactly what Jesus did. We have been anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit for our responsibilities that we have been given by God to do here on earth. We are anointed for what God has called us to do. I know when people hear or, or somebody, uh, somebody being anointed, you think about somebody anointed, a lot of times people will think, well, either a, a pastor, a prophet, a, uh, a musician, a preacher, they're anointed. But you're anointed. You are anointed. You know, one of the verses, my favorite verse, and, and I think everybody who's been in youth ministry knows this. My children say this every single morning, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans not to harm you. Plans to give you hope 
and plans to give you a future. That is a scripture that I want deep down on the inside of every one of those kids in the youth ministry, every one of my kids, because I want them to understand that when the world tries to tell them something different, God has a plan for their life. It's not God that's trying to harm you. That's God trying to prosper you. God's got a plan and a hope and a future for you. That's something that I think we need to get down on the inside of us. And there is a promise that comes with an anointing. That promise right there of the plan, the future, has an anointing with it. You can't walk out the plan of God in your life without operating in the anointing of God. You have been anointed to, anointed to do what God has planned out and called you to do. You know, you may be anointed to uh, be a car salesman, a stay-at-home mom, a teacher, a carpenter, whatever other million opportunities and options there are out there. You are anointed, and God has given you grace and favor to walk in that anointing. With the anointing comes authority. When you walk in purpose, while others are living ordinary and average, you have the authority to make you walk in favor in the realm of the extraordinary. You may look at people, might look at you and go, how is it that you do that? How is it you do that? I walk in grace and favor. How is it you're selling more cars than anybody? I walk in favor. How is it that you're able to do this? I walk in grace and I walk in favor. And in the anointing of God in my life. Anointing gives you authority to work and move in the spiritual realm. Operating in the anointing, Jesus declares that we have authority over all the works of the devil. All the works of the devil. Luke chapter 10 verse 19 says this, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. All the power. This is what God wants each of us walking in, regardless of your occupation. God wants us walking in the realm where we'll, we'll tell the devil what to do and where to go. He doesn't tell us and dictate anything to us. As I mentioned, God has anointed you with a purpose in a career field, but in everything, we are called to take authority over the works of the devil. It doesn't matter what you do, where, if you're a stay-at-home mom, if you, uh, it doesn't matter what you do. Your role is to take authority over the devil at all things. That means if you're a car salesman that recognizes your role to be sell, to sell cars, you can still sell cars, but you can also speak healing over the sick and see them recover because you know the authority you have the over the devil. You can be a stay-at-home mom that knows and operates in the anointing that can cast out devils without thinking twice. You can be a mechanic that works on cars but also uses the authority given to you to not let the devil have one inch in your life or other people's lives with addiction, depression, or infirmity. You, know, you may have motor oil on your hands, but you can use those same hands to anoint with the oil of the Holy Ghost. Amen? At the same time. <laughs> Hallelujah. You need to walk in the anointing that God has placed in you and move in the supernatural and see the impossible happen. Operating in the anointing of God in your life is crucial to you and to the sphere of influence around you. Sick people need the anointing that you have. People bound up by anxiety, depression, fear, addiction need the anointing you have. The devil and his spineless pack of demons should be fearful of you and your anointing. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondages and sets people free. It talks about that in Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27. And it said, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off the shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the because of the anointing. Isaiah defines the anointing as a burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. Now, a yoke is not talking about an egg, okay? A yoke is a harness used around the neck of an ox. We have that picture. Can you put that picture up? So we have here 
It's a harness, a heavy harness to keep them on task, but also keep them in bondage. It keeps them and uses them for hard labor, okay? So in Isaiah, when it talks about the anointing breaking the yokes of bondage, it's referring to the anointing of God being able to destroy the bondages people are in that is tangling them, that is weighing them down, that is strangling them, and allows them to have freedom. Hallelujah. The anointing is literally God on flesh doing what flesh can't do. And God chooses to use us to see his word come to pass with power. You know, he commands two things of us when it comes to this. First, that we believe. That we walk in faith and we trust in him. And number two is that we act and we use the anointing and the authority given to us. It talks about this in in Mark chapter 16. Is this okay? In Mark chapter 16, in verse 14 through 18, it says, Later he appeared to the eleven, and as he sat at the table, he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of hearts, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. These signs shall follow those who believe. Believe. That's the command. We got to believe. And here at the beginning of this verse, he's rebuking some of his disciples for lack of believing. He goes, I got to have you believe. We've gone through this whole process. I'm getting ready to take off. I got to have you believe. Greatest hit event in the history of the world just happened. I got to have you guys believe in it. Those who believe, he's given us the authority. Cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick and see them recover. This is a promise and authority that we have been given the right before Jesus. Right before Jesus went up to heaven, this is what he said. And at no point since then have these commands changed. He didn't say, this is good for the next six months. This is what I want you to do. He didn't put an ending point on it. So that means that's still our responsibility right now. It's our responsibility to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. It's our responsibility to cast out demons and speak with new tongues. It's our our responsibility to believe. And since at no point these commands have changed, the orders are still there. Believe and act. The problem that we often see is the same thing that Jesus' disciples faced. These are the same people who were walking with him. The same people who were listening directly to Jesus, listening to what he was saying, witnessing miracles, passing out the bread baskets, and and, and the bread, uh, five loaves, two fishes, and coming back and seeing 12 baskets after five. These are the same people who witnessed and experienced all of that who still fell into disbelief. Jesus asked them multiple times on multiple occasions, where is your faith? O ye of little faith. Have I not told you? <laughs> Have I not showed you? They fall back into this belief. And you've, you've heard Pastor King say this even recently. And it's so true. Faith is the currency that Jesus uses. Faith is the currency that we use for the kingdom. And if you don't believe and you don't walk in faith, you'll never effectively walk in your anointing. Let me repeat that. If you don't believe and you don't walk in faith, you will never effectively walk in your anointing. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Very familiar verse. It says, you can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you'll receive it. I think sometimes this verse is taken out of context here because what's it saying? You can pray for anything, and you'll receive it. 
there's a qualifier in there, and that qualifier is faith. If you don't have faith, you're not going to receive it, no matter how much you pray for it. If you pray, if you believe, and you have faith, you will receive it. Faith is a qualifier. And you can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. How can you move in authority and the power of the anointing if you don't believe? The answer is you can't. Today I'm talking to you about you get what you pay for, paying the price for a greater anointing in your life. Hallelujah. One thing that you need to do to pay the price for the anointing is make sure you're constantly increasing your faith. If you don't believe in what you're selling, you're not going to be good at selling. I learned that in the car business, and I was not a good car salesman. I was terrible. I didn't know the product very well, and it just didn't work well. Steve, I wouldn't have worked well. John, I wouldn't have worked well in your industry. <laughs> but... One thing you need to do is you need to pay the price for the anointing and make sure that you're constantly increasing your faith. You do that by maintaining a strong commitment to the study of the Word of God. Be students of the Word of God. you got to know what you're talking about. you got to understand what you're talking about. Amen? I think the problem that we see so many times is there are people standing up with microphones and talking and doing different things that have no idea what they're talking about. Self-proclaimed prophets, so self-proclaimed people putting themselves in ministry, they have no idea what they're talking about and they're leading people astray. you got to know what you're talking about. Hallelujah. You do that by understanding what it says in the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Hearing over and over and over the Word of God, continually putting the Word of God before you and in you. Knowing what the Word says. Know what it says about healing. Know what the Bible says about healing. Know what the Bible says about grace. Know what the Bible says about mercy, about the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. Know what the Bible talks about the the, the authority every believer has as a child of God. Know what you have. Operate in that. Become a student of the Word. The more you know and comprehend and believe, the greater your faith level is to move and operate in the anointing. How are you going to lay hands and pray for somebody if you don't believe that God will heal them? Hallelujah. I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to get this scripture right here in your spirit. John chapter 10 verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that may have life and may have it more abundantly. You understand that sickness doesn't come from God. Evil against you does not come from God. That gives you the information right there to discern what is of God and what isn't. You can begin to rebuke, cast down, cast out what goes on against what God has said about you. Well, God has made me sick. God ain't made you sick. The devil made you sick. God can make you well. It's God's will that, I, I, that I'm ill. No, it's not God's will that you're ill. That's why it's so important that you know what the Word of God says so you can stand up against those lies that, that are thrown at you. Amen? Hallelujah. God's plan has to, is, is to prosper you and not to harm you. God's plan is never to harm you but to give you life with abundance. So increasing faith is the first thing you need to do in order to pay a greater price for the anointing of God. The stronger your faith, the stronger your anointing. I truly believe that. The second thing you need to do is pay the price for a greater anointing is to be obedient to the Spirit of God and do what He tells you to do. You know, I remember very vividly a vision that the Lord had showed me one time before I was a pastor, before I was in full-time ministry. And I'll tell you right now, to this day, it's been over 20 years ago, God showed me this. And there's some things that I've seen come about through this. But I remember one day, I was, I was, the Lord was showing me this vision, and he was showing me very clearly some of the different things that I was going to be doing in ministry. 
And, and at that time, it blew me away. I was, I was like, wow, whoa, that's, that's amazing. Miracles, signs, wonders, healings, different things, ministry, all sorts of things. And I'm, as I'm watching this, all of a sudden it backs out as if it's a television set. And I'm watching it on a TV. And, and I notice there's a, a tag hanging on it. And it's a price tag. And I remember grabbing it and looking at that, and God said, these are the things. This is the price you need to pay for the great anointing that I'm showing you today. There's a price to pay for a greater anointing. And God was calling me to do more, to trust more, to fast more, pray more, be bolder, sacrifice things that other people wouldn't be willing to sacrifice. He said, this is what I have for you, and this is the price tag I want you to pay for it. I realized in order, to, in order to flow in that anointing, it required more from me. And the price for a greater anointing is to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. Amen? If you can't hear the Holy Spirit, that tells you you need to spend a little bit more time in the presence of God to hear His Spirit. I'll tell you, there's a lot of times where I've prayed and God's called me out because I'll pray, God, I need this. God, I'm believing for this. God, to tr God, to help me. God, do this. Pray for them. And then I get up and I leave. And God says, do I not get an opportunity to speak? I was like, I sat there quiet for a little bit. But God doesn't work on a, on a fast food drive through kind of format. God wants you in his presence. And there are times that maybe you need to sit there a little longer before God decides to, to speak to you because he wants all of you. And I know in our, in our life where we're so busy and things are, I got to go, I got to do this, I got to get this, I got to get this, I got to get this done. But being able to take time to just stop and listen to God as he talks to you, I'm going to tell you is an important thing. It's an obedience thing, it really is. God wants you to sit in his presence and he wants you to listen. You've been in a relationship, you talk to somebody where only it's a, it's a one-sided conversation. You'll, get, you'll call on the phone, and they'll talk to you for 45 minutes about them, and then say, I, I got to go. <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm good. I'm doing all right. Well, that's not the relationship God's looking to have. God really does want to speak to you. And I'm going to tell you right now, God does speak to you. I know there are many people who said, I've never heard God's voice. I've never heard God speak. I'm going to tell you right now, the sheep hear my voice and they know me and I know them. God wants you to hear his voice. One of the things that I encourage you and, and challenge you today is take extra time in your prayer time and listen to God. Maybe say, God, I'm going to let you go first and just sit quiet in his presence and listen to him and let the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you, you pray in the spirit and you begin to, to work yourself into that position where you hear, you're able to hear God. Don't take your phone into your prayer room. Take your Apple Watch off. Sometimes take those distractions away and allow God to be able to speak to you so you can hear him clearly. Amen? For me, in order to be obedient, I needed to reevaluate some relationships in my life. God made it very clear that there were some that I needed to end and there were some that I needed to strengthen. And so these were things that God had me do, and he instructed me to spend more time in the presence of God and, and knowing him and finding out about the spirit and the very character of God that I could. To pay the price for me required some long-term fasts. I heard God telling me that. And uh, not just a certain number. He didn't say, Tim, I want you to do 10 fasts. He says, I want you to make a lifestyle of fasting. And... Uh, I remember not too long after this vision, I was actually on a seven-day fast. And I was about five days in to the fast, and we were doing uh, some ministry outreach. And I remember there was this one girl that was spotted towards the back of the room. And she had a smile on her face. She looked like she was enjoying what was going on. But the Lord instructed me to go up to her and ask her this question, how are you doing? And the minute I did... That smile went off her face, 
and tears started coming down her eyes and rolling down her face. And at that moment, the Lord revealed to me that there was a spirit of suicide on her. And I looked at her and I said, is this true? And she goes, every day I think about committing suicide. And in that moment, I laid hands on her and I prayed for her and she was delivered in that very moment. But I believe it was the greater anointing. It was, I believe it was because of the obedience to God in that moment. And, I, and so I tell you, when you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, the anointing within you takes charge. I think about this outreach that we're going on this week. When you go out and you, uh, you know, uh, going out on Sutherland Avenue or, or Ricky, as you guys go out and, and you're doing the, um, um, the evangelism outreach. The Holy Spirit within you will give you discernment. The Holy Spirit within you will give you words of knowledge. The Holy Spirit within you will speak to you on certain things. I believe that. I believe that's how the Holy Spirit works. Amen? So being in tune with the Holy Spirit. You know, another important way of paying the price for a greater anointing requires true true repentance. God wants us to be clean. God never said perfect, but clean. He makes us perfect. Amen? God dealt with me about repenting and getting things in my life that were not right, making them right. I was uh, serving the Lord, but there were things in my life that were not pleasing to God. And I, and I think I think if we reevaluated our lives on a constant basis, I think there may be things in our lives that we could do better on. I think there are some things that maybe aren't pleasing to God. And it's those things that we constantly evaluating ourselves and making sure, God, am I holy? Am I living the life? Is, are there things within me that you want to see corrected? Sometimes asking those questions, the Lord will show you some things. And some things may be painful. You may not like to hear it. But I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's God working. I, I, want, I want to work in spirit and in truth. Amen? I want, uh, God, if there's something within me, I want to know. I want you to tell me. And he will. I, I truly believe he will. But the Holy Spirit showed me things that I needed to make right with certain people. Things that I had done wrong in the past. And the Holy Spirit said to me, I will not use you in a greater way until you repent for the, some of these specific things. And, uh, and I needed to repent. And um, this is something that's very hard to do that nobody really wants to do, but God says, I will put a ceiling on your ability to flow in the anointing if you refuse to be obedient. Boy, I was like, no. You know, sometimes saying sorry isn't enough. You know, I had a really close relationship with, with my pastor early on with my walk from the Lord, and he happened to be my best friend's dad. And I remember there was a time where um, I made a pretty significant lie to him. And it was like, I, I, lightning didn't strike me down, and I thought lightning might have struck me down, but it didn't. Um, but I made a pretty significant lie and tried to cover up a dumb mistake that I made. And years later, I was at a different church in a different city, and I was praying for God to move me into the youth pastor role. And I remember very clearly he said, until you repent to your former pastor, for that lie you told him, I will not advance you. And uh, and I, I mean, I was okay. And so uh, I went to him, and I shared him the situation. Uh, back then, I explained to him that I lied, and I explained to him why I lied. And he forgave me, and he barely remembered what I was talking about. But within weeks of me being obedient, I was moved into the youth pastor role. And I look at that moment, I'm like, I made right what was wrong because I was obedient to God. I didn't want to do it. I surely did not want to do that. <laughs> but it was the right thing to do. And, you know, there's a saying I have on my wall that says, do what's right and trust God for the results. And sometimes you just need to do right and whatever happens, happens. You know, and just trust God for it. So, God said it was the fact that you lied to leadership who was in the role that I was praying to step into. That's why that one was such a significant thing. 
And so uh, it was dumb, and I shouldn't have done it. But God still saw it as a big deal and had me repent to him for it. So as I said, repentance isn't just about saying sorry. It's about confessing and changing course, and in some cases, making the right, or the right that was wrong, making right the wrong, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, when you're paying a, a, the price for a greater anointing, it requires you to live holy. Nobody was perfect but Jesus, but having a heart of repentance to do what's right, seeking after God, and hearing what he has to say. So this morning I'm talking to you about paying the price for a greater anointing in your life. So the first thing we do is operate in faith. The second thing is be obedient. Walk in obedience to God. And number three is be active. Be active means use your anointing. Take your authority over your situations. Take authority over sickness. Take authority over demonic activity. Be a leader in prayer, praying with power and with authority that you have within you. Don't be shy. Don't be timid. Pray knowing that when you pray, when you speak, things happen. Be convinced. Know that when I open my mouth, demons don't like it. When I open my mouth, things happen. When I lay hands on the sick, people recover. Have that confidence and know that when you do it, God will do what he said. Hallelujah. Have boldness to pray with people on the spot who ask for prayer. Don't push it off till later. Don't be afraid to ask people if they want pray. prayer. Don't be afraid to ask people who are sick if you can pray with them. You got the answer. You got the answer. You got the anointing. You got the power. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Hallelujah. When you've been given all authority over all the works of the devil, don't let some slip. Don't accept it. Take your authority with your anointing and put some hurt on the work of the devil. Hallelujah. You ever get orange juice that you've had in your fridge for a little while and it's all kind of set it, settled down at the bottom? And in order to drink it, what do you got to do? Shake it up. Shake it up. Shake up the anointing within you. It's about time we shook it up. Let me tell you why. Because you, you owe it to your family to be stirred up. You owe it to your co-workers, to your neighbors to be stirred up. You owe it to your friends, to your church, to the kingdom of God to be stirred up in the anointing and in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Stir up the anointing that you have. And let's put a hurt on the devil. Pull it out of the bottom drawer. Shake it off. Dust it off a little bit. Get it out of that dusty attic and let's begin to use what God has given you. 2 Timothy chapter 1 says this, Therefore I remind you to stir up. Everyone say stir up. Stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and love and of a sound mind. I got news for you today. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. That same anointing power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Hallelujah. This morning, stir it up. Stir it up. Say, stir it up. As I said earlier, we are in a world that is being bombarded by sin and by evil, wave after wave. God has given us a tool to combat that, and it's the anointing of God, authority over all the works of the devil. I could, each, I could each ask each one of you what issues you're going through right now. And I'm going to tell you, you have authority over all the works of the devil. You're dealing with a health issue, you have authority over all the works of the devil. If you're dealing with a financial crisis, you've got authority over all the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me tell you what happens when you put your foot down and refuse to take any more garbage from the devil. Your situation begins to change. Your perspective shifts. Possessions, things that were important to you before become not as important. You begin to hunger after the things of God on a new level because it becomes contagious. 
Other people start walking in the anointing that God has given them because you start walking in the anointing. People say, I want what you have. I want what you have. There's a price to pay. Hallelujah. When everything looks so dark and gloomy, all of a sudden, when you begin to use your anointing, revival begins to break out. We've seen recent on the campus of Asbury University up in Wilmore, Kentucky, about two hours and 45 minutes from here. Small Christian college, Methodist college with the enrollment of about 1,400 students in their chapel service where they were teaching the word and they were praying and they were worshiping. They found themselves not wanting to stop. There was a hunger there. They continued to pray and worship for days and upon days and thousands traveled waiting in lines to get into that chapel for hours. Up until this last weekend, they had 50,000 people come to this small town because they wanted to get a bit of revival. They're hungry. They had to shut the city down. Because there were too many cars. It wasn't necessarily the school on that aspect. It was the city said, we can't handle it. We can't handle all these cars. People were flying in from all over the world to come to this small town in Kentucky because God was moving. In this move, demons were being cast out of people. People were getting out of wheelchairs. I've seen these videos. People getting out of wheelchairs. All sorts of miracles and healings taking place. Salvations by the thousands. I sent Pastor Nora a video the other day. There were people, the meeting started getting outside because they couldn't get him inside. And all of a sudden, there there was somebody talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in a matter of just a few moments, hundreds of people who've never spoken tongues before began praying in the Spirit and getting filled with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was happening. All of these things, God was moving. And the message that was preached in that service that started the revival was sharing about the love of Christ and having a heart of repentance. This move of God started out of hunger for Jesus and having a repentive heart. Hallelujah. Now we see it spreading to college campuses, Lee University, all over the world. I saw, I saw a video yesterday of the revival started is, is in Pakistan now, and in Israel, and all over the world. People are hungry for the things of God. They want revival. And it started with people using their anointing that they have and a hunger for God, and it spread. People are hungry for revival. We pray for it, we pray for them, and we celebrate what God is doing. I've seen so many critics, well, this is not a true move of God. (laughs) Shut up. You wouldn't know what it is. It hit you in the face. When God moves, it sometimes isn't exactly how we envision it or script it out. You sit there and think, where is revival going to start? It's probably going to start with a group of Pentecostals who pray in tongues. (laughs) This started at a Methodist college, people. Hallelujah. God will do what he wants to do when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. And I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to get up there and script God and tell God, this is how you got to do it. If you're going to move, you're going to do it this way. God says, I will do it my way. My way or the highway. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'll take it God's way. And I'll tell you right now, I'll just get in. Lord, I will come and I will get in. I don't care where it is, what it is, I want in. I want in the presence of God. I want the revival of God. I want that. I want a greater anointing. I want to move in it. I want the power. that I lay hands on the sick. They recover. I want the power and the authority to tell the devil, get out of here, and he listens to me. Because I tell you what, you got it. You got that. I want revival. I want to see it. Here you have these young people. These young people who are not only witnessing God pouring out his spirit in the last days, but they're experiencing it firsthand. And I love it. You got other kids saying, I want that. And look what happens. Here, you sit here and see what the media is trying to portray and and put out there on television. You see half Super Bowl halftime shows. You see all this crap that's going out there. And I said it, I'm sorry. You got all this stuff that's going out there. But then look at the young people. You look at the young people. 
there's revival going on. When, they, when, they, when, they're, when they're writing off the young people, God says, I'm moving in those young people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are seeing our sons and daughters prophesy, and old men are dreaming dreams, and young men are seeing vision. God is moving. God is pouring out His Spirit, and I don't know about you, but I want it. I want it. I don't know about you, but I want revival for me and for my family and for church. Hallelujah. For my community, for my nation. We need it. Hallelujah. How many want revival in your home, at your work, in your church, in your schools? Come on. You know, I pray there are people in this room and people who are watching online this morning who would say, I not only want it, I need it. I got to have it. I got to have God moving in my life. I need revival. I pray for revival. I'm going to see revival. Whew. This morning I'm talking about you get what you pay for. Revival is fueled by the anointing of God with a hunger for God. It's precious. It's powerful and it's available to whosoever. The real question is how much do you want it? There are no coupons or special QR codes for this kind of anointing. This requires you to be willing to do what others won't do. I want you to hear me around that. This requires you to do what others won't do. This requires you to walk in faith. This requires a greater knowledge of God and a deeper relationship with Him and getting yourself connected in with the Holy Spirit. Put it in your arm. Get like an IV, just an IV drip of the Holy Ghost. Keep it constant. It requires repentance and obedience. It requires boldness and courage to do what God tells you to do when God tells you to do it. God's not looking for the most popular, the richest, or the most powerful in position. God's looking for the most hungry, the repentant, and the willing. You ever, you ever been not really hungry? But then all of a sudden you smell your neighbor grilling burgers on the grill, and now you're starving. Now you're like, I got to have one. I don't even know them, but I'm going to knock on their door and see if they got any leftover. But once you get into a deeper presence of God, there's an aroma in the spirit that makes you hungrier for God than you've ever been. I pray that aroma in the room this morning. I pray the aroma in this room this morning that makes you hungrier for God than you've ever been before. God, just let that aroma just permeate this room today, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, as we start off Love Week, people need to experience the presence and the love of God in a new and a fresh way. We live in a time of AI, artificial intelligence, where you never know what's real and what's fake. What's a filter, what's not a filter, what's real, you, you don't know. Whose voice is that? Is that a real voice? Is that not a real voice? There are too many people posing as representatives of God without the power of God working through them. Matthew chapter 10 says this in verse 7, and I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Version. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. See, we have been given authority and the command to preach to heal, to raise the dead, cast out devils. The authority was given to us. It gives us the rights to do these things. It's the anointing that gives us the ability to do these things. Hallelujah. People need to see the real love. The real loving healing and saving, forgiving power of the Most High God. This week, that's our opportunity. We got a great opportunity.
to share that with people. Let them see the real God. We know the real God. Let them know the real God. Let them experience the real God. Let's see what takes the ordinary and let's show them the extraordinary through the anointing of God. Hallelujah. When you walk in the anointing of God, you get to be the real side of God many people have never seen before. When you go out and share the love of God this week, imagine that they, what they feel when, they, when you pray for them and all of a sudden they're healed. Imagine this week when you go out and pray for them and you ask them if they want to accept Christ and they become a brand new brother and sister in the Lord. Imagine that through your boldness to share the gospel with somebody, they experience love in a new way. When you tell them, when you tell somebody God loves them, where'd my card go? When you tell somebody God loves them, the Holy Spirit is flowing through you to impact them in a powerful way. Your words, you have your words. You say, God loves you. That's words, your actions, your kindness may seem insignificant, but not when the Holy Spirit gets behind it. That's exactly what happens. You open your mouth, and it's God doing what flesh can't do. God moving in their hearts and changing their hearts. You can't do it, but the power of God through you can do it. That's the opportunity we have this week. It's the anointing of God flowing in and through you to bring about God's purpose and plan here on the earth. What a powerful responsibility and honor that is. What a huge responsibility and honor that is. You look at a big giant fruit tree. Anybody ever seen a big giant apple tree or orange tree or whatever? You see all that fruit on that tree. And the Bible says our job is to produce fruit. If you don't produce fruit, you get cut out. So our job is to produce fruit. And that fruit is a representation of the anointing of God. Because that fruit isn't for the tree. That fruit is for others to eat and get strength and nourished. And I believe that's exactly what the anointing of God is in our lives. It's for other people. God wants to put it in us so that we can take it out and pass it out to people and let them experience the power and the move and the love of the faithful loving God. I ask you this morning, do you want God to use you in a greater way? Hallelujah. Do you want a stronger anointing operating in your life? Are you willing to pay the price for it? Stand to your feet everywhere, would you? I believe right now God wants to make a deposit of his Holy Spirit on those who are hungry today. Who says, I want it? Who says, I want it? Hallelujah. Come up here, Sister Jenny. Cup your hands, will you? Come right over here. Cup your hand. Everybody, cup your hands right now, will you? I believe that when God pours his anointing out, He's pouring pouring it into you so it can flow through you. You're at home. That anointing is on you and your family. You're at work. That anointing is flowing through you. God's pouring it into you, and it's flowing through you to those people who need it. That's the anointing of God flowing through you. Cup your hands. When you've got your hands cupped, say, God, I want to receive what you have for me. I want to receive it. Let it flow in you and let it flow through you. Let it flow in you and flow through you. Say, God, flow through me this morning. 
flow through me this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Holy Spirit, as we cup our hands right now, we ask you to fill us. Pour your spirit into us right now, a fresh anointing right now. A fresh anointing of your spirit that flows in us, Lord, so we can flow through us to those who need it, to the people who need the healing, to people who need the greater anointing. Say this morning, God, I desire a greater anointing. Say, I desire a greater anointing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Just right there, keep your hands cupped. There's something special happening right now in the Spirit. I feel it right now. The Holy Spirit is doing something right now. A fresh filling of the Holy Spirit right now. Say, fill me this morning. Hallelujah. Right now he's doing it. Right now he's doing it. Right now he's doing it. Hallelujah. See, there's a freshness coming upon you right now in the name of Jesus. I believe it. A freshness coming upon you right now. To be not only successful in what you do at work, but more successful in the spirit. There's an anointing coming upon you. And on those hands, not just to play guitar, but when you lay hands on the sick, they will recover in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. There is an anointing coming upon you this morning. So when you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. You know why? Because my B-I-B-L-E tells me so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now lift your hands to the Lord and say, I receive it today, God. Hallelujah. I receive your presence, God. I receive it. I'm hungry for you this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Move right now, God. Move in our hearts today, Lord in a greater way. God, we are willing to pay the price for the anointing that you have put upon us today. Hallelujah. a greater anointing coming upon you, James, unlike you've ever had before. The power of God is going to move in you, and the things that you've done, God is going to do greater things in you than you've even imagined or you've ever thought of. Those hands are healing hands in Jesus' name. You have power and authority to lay hands on the sick and see them recover in Jesus' name. That's not just for you. That's not just for your household. That's for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a fresh power and anointing coming upon you right now in Jesus' name. In, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Raise your hand. I want that. Say, I want it. Hallelujah.
and these hands are going to become healing hands. Things that you never imagined you could do before, God says, I am moving through you to do them. Every area of your life will become successful. Every area of your business, every area in your spirit, you will be, you will go farther than you ever imagined. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can comprehend the things that the Lord has in store for me. Russell, that promise is for you because God has great and mighty things for you and you too, Debbie. In Jesus' name, I speak it. Hallelujah. Come on, give God a praise. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord is here today. Receive it. This morning.
Sing it one more time. Can you keep us Just give God a big thunderous praise this morning. Come on, He's moving in this place. He's moving in this place. He's moving. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you feel the presence of God here today? Hallelujah. I charge you this morning. I charge you, let this week go out and don't let this just be a one day or one week thing. Let the power and the fire of God just move through you. Say, these hands are anointed hands. These hands can heal the sick, can raise the dead, can cast out devils because of the authority and the anointing that I have within me. In Jesus' name, come on, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. God is good. God is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I feel his presence. I feel his presence. I was like, I'm, I, 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 my thought would be to walk off and say, I can't do it yet. God, I will just, let's just listen to his presence right now.
for the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. Hallelujah. And His mercy endures forever. God, we love you. We glorify your name, Lord. We are hungry this morning. You can see the hunger in the room today, God. I just heard, I felt God saying, there are some of you with broken hearts in here today. And not just a, a sadness, but almost like an overwhelming heaviness. He said, I'm breaking that today. I'm breaking the broken heart today. I'm healing the broken heart today. Hallelujah. morning, if you're in this room and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I'm sitting here, I've been talking about the anointing that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. This morning is your morning. It says that God's favor is on you and today is the day of salvation. If you're in the room this morning, you'd say, Pastor Tim, I've never asked Jesus into my life. But today is the day I want to give Jesus my life. I'm experiencing him. I'm feeling him this morning. Or you say, Pastor Tim, I've walked away from God, but I need to come back, and I want to come back today. If that's you this morning, just wherever you just slip up your hand throughout the house this morning. Say, I want to give Jesus my life. I want to return to Jesus this morning. Amen. I see you up there. Say, this morning, I want to return to Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to give Jesus my life for the first time. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. I'll tell you, the greatest miracle is somebody who's on the road to hell that gets turned around and turned to heaven. The greatest miracle is salvation. Amen. Amen. And we are experiencing that in this room this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone, just, just pray this with me this morning. Re repeat this after me, especially if you raise your hand. Say, Jesus, I take you today to be my Lord and my Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Sin and Satan, I don't serve you. I serve Jesus. And I always will. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give God a thunderous ovation of praise in this place. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. You are good, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Maybe we're not supposed to, you know. But uh, I have a couple things I need to tell you, so if you'll uh, just give me your attention, I'll, uh, I'll uh, mention them real quickly, and then we can go out in the same uh, spirit or or stay or whatever we whatever we want to do. Uh, again, this is Love Week. And it uh, begins today and it goes through March 4th. And you want to be active, you want to be involved, you want to be part of it. And we're doing a neighborhood outreach next Saturday and as part of Love Week. And we'll be reaching out to our neighbors off suburb and avenue, doing door-to-door -door evangelism and providing them with food. And you can be a part of this. Uh, if you, you know, maybe you're not able to go on the day we actually do the outreach, but there's going to be food prep opportunities and materials anyway this tuesday february 28th uh, you can help with that if you're unable to help with the actual evangelism on saturday march 4th and you can sign up uh, today in the blue room or redemptionchurch.com forward slash love week also next sunday we're having a book signing pastor king has a new book speaking faith-filled words there will be a table in the lobby, and then after the service, uh, Pastor Ed will be signing those books. What a wonderful service we've had today. Pastor <laughs> what are you doing up here? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, as soon as I got down here, yeah. I felt the Lord say that we don't have to be done. No. And so as soon as we pray, if you want to come to the altar and pray some more, you can play. If you feel like you need to be dismissed, you're dismissed. There's no, no condemnation. Nobody's saying, why are they going? No, 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 no. You got to do what you got to do. If you want to stay and pray, go stay and play for a little bit longer. You're more than welcome to come and pray. Okay? I felt like I needed to say that. So, amen. Well, Father, your presence is very real here today. And Father, we just thank you for your words today. We thank you for the anointing today and we pray today Father God whether we're leaving or whether we're staying we just thank you for your presence and your peace we sense today in Jesus name